London taxi badges are earned, not bought, through something called the knowledge. But how do you actually learn the knowledge? It just seems massive and crazy. Well, in this video, I'm gonna break down the individual steps that you can do if you wanna earn one of these badges. This is great for aspiring knowledge students or for anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about the process. Let's get started. First off, to have a go at the knowledge, you don't actually need to do anything official or apply anything like that. You can just give it a go and just see if the process sticks with you. To get started, you need just two things, a blue book and a map of London. That's it. You don't have to worry about like, oh, I'm not going to do it on a scooter. Do I do it in a car? No, no, worry about all that stuff later. We just want to get you into the process and see if you actually enjoy it. Even applying, that comes later on. You might as well give it a go. Probably similar to joining the gym. It'd be really ridiculous if you've never been to the gym in your life to think, yeah, you know what? I'm going to get a whole year's membership. No, you generally go down there, have a tour of the facilities, speak with a personal trainer, maybe get a personal training session, and then think about your membership and how you're gonna approach this mammoth task later. It's much the same with the knowledge. And I'd highly recommend this process because just to apply is about 120 pounds, but also to complete that application, you need to do a criminal record check, which is about 54 pounds, and you need to have a medical from your GP. So out the gate, you're talking up to about 300 pounds just for the privilege of applying. Also, when you apply, you have just two years from when your application gets accepted until you start taking your examinations, until you have to do the examinations. Otherwise, you have to pay that application fee all over again. Now, two years is more than long enough to get that bit done, but you never know what might happen. Life might throw you a curveball. You might have a family emergency. Something happens. All of a sudden, that two year window really compresses down quite fast. Just ensure that when you apply, you know you wanna go through the process. There's no point in applying because it's not like you're gonna get like a, you know, a nice medal or a starter pack or something like that. No, it's just to get you in the system. You don't get any brownie points or bonuses for applying. Now, what about transport? You always see knowledge boys and girls going around on those scooters with the big board with the map in front of them. In theory, there's nothing stopping you from doing the knowledge in any form of transport that you like. If you live in London, you could do it on a push bike. You could even walk the runs and go and pick up points of interest that way. But of course, you're talking about efficiency here. Bearing in mind that some of the runs might be, I don't know, six miles long. Obviously, driving them is going to have a far greater advantage than walking them. The most popular option is, of course, a scooter because they're relatively inexpensive. They're very good on fuel consumption, insurance, things like that. If you need to pull over quickly and make a quick note, you can do that relatively easy, where it's a bit more difficult in a car. And of course, traffic and congestion charges, things like that. So that's generally the most popular option. And then some people, uh, myself included, might opt to also use a car. So for instance, I live very far out of London, so I would use the motorbike in the summer and I'll use the car in the winter months. I'd often get up really, really early because that's what you need to do with the car. Because if you left it too late, you'd get stuck in too much traffic and it would be really inefficient on your time. Time is one of the biggest things on the knowledge. When you get really deep into it, as we'll learn throughout this video, you won't have time for anything else. So any way you can shave off as much time as possible and be more efficient with your studying and your learning, that's gonna pay dividends into how quickly you can get your badge. Some of you might also be wondering, is it the green badge that I apply for or the yellow badge? Now, if you've been to central London and you've seen a taxi drive past, probably 99% likely that it's gonna be a green badge driver. That's where our knowledge, we do the main six mile radius of Charing Cross. Um, so that stretches right up to Tottenham in the north, that'll go um, you know, down south, talking into like Wimbledon, Lewisham, uh, Streatham, places like that. And you have to learn all those streets in that area there. And that gives you, as a green badge driver, the right to pick up and ply for hire in central London, the kind of traditional taxi driver that we think of. There's also a yellow badge driver or a suburban driver. And now this is good if you live in like an outer suburb of London, but you're restricted to being able to work just within that area. So there's loads of these, I don't know too much about it, but what's important is their knowledge test to do a yellow badge 
is pretty much just as long as a green badge. And once you've got it, you're restricted to just one area of London. If you want to then upgrade to a green badge, you've pretty much got to do the whole process from the start again. Most people generally go for a green badge license. In terms of actually formally applying for the knowledge, you need to be 18 years old. You can actually pass the knowledge before your 21st birthday. However, you cannot be granted a license until you are 21 years old. I've heard of individuals who've done this. You know, they've applied to go on the knowledge at age 18, got through it in record quick time, you know, of two years or so, and they can't actually drive a cab until they turn to the age of 21. Other reasons why you might want to apply is, of course, if you've got a slightly shady criminal record uh, or medical background, just important to get yourself into the system. TfL can look over that. And of course, they will only accept you on if you meet their criteria. So it's a good idea if you don't know if you're going to be accepted or not because of a background issue, get it applied. And then that's kind of a bit of a headache rather than going, you know, six months down the line, getting invested in the process, then applying and then getting rejected because of your past. One of the benefits of applying is that you get to be able to go to an initial talk. This is something they've brought back from the good old days of the knowledge, where basically you can turn up to the examination center and you have a bit of a conversation or dialogue with the examiner. So there might be a few of you in that room, but it's a great opportunity to understand what the process is like, where the examination center is, and just get ahead really, just make sure you are on the right process that this is for you. Also on the knowledge, you have to be in formal business attire throughout the entire process. So for gents, that's a suit and tie. And for ladies, you know, something of formal business attire. If I turned up to an initial talk like this, they would have a pretty stern talking down to me. And if I went to any other examination following that initial talk like this, they would turn me away. They'd say, no, you, you can't sit the examination. It's an appearance. You actually have to conduct yourself physically as much as you do sitting down and taking that test mentally. It's just one of those traditions that's part of the process. So it's really important that that very first initial talk that you go to, put a suit on, get used to it, because anytime you go anywhere near a TFL building for the purposes of examination, you will have to be wearing that suit and don't forget your tie because that is mandatory for gentlemen as well. So to kick things off, every single knowledge student will learn something called the blue book. Now, when you apply from TfL, you will actually get a full list of 320 runs. And it's up to you to interpret what is the shortest and most direct route between those points. Because what might be the one best route one day when they introduce a closure, i.e. during COVID, completely changes the most optimum route. So it's always a constantly evolving task. What you put down as gospel as getting from one place to another might change. But what the majority of knowledge students will do is purchase their blue books from an established knowledge school because they will use their resources and experience to give their interpretation of what the best route is. So the very first run, Manor House Station to Gibson Square. There's lots of different ways that you can do it. But if you wanted to go out and figure it out for yourself, it's a lot of time going out on the roads, making sure that you can actually do those streets. Then you, if you get the wrong street, you've got to go back, redo it again. So sometimes it's just easy to buy it from a knowledge school. But remember, you're going to have to keep these up to date because roads will change over your time and the knowledge. But let's talk real basics here. What happens? So optimally, starting out, you'll have blue books from a knowledge school. You'll have a map. What do I do next? You can go ahead and look at that run before you physically go and run it. And optimally, I would pen it up on a map as well, just so you know roughly what part of London it's in, what kind of turns you're going to be making and how quick the turns are. Because when you look at the run listed road by road within a knowledge book or within a blue book, you have no concept of how quick a left or a right could be. You could be going down a road for a good half a mile, one mile before you then take a left. And conversely, you might only go down a road a few hundred yards before you then take a left. So it's really important, I find, to put them on the map first, pen them up in advance, so you know roughly where you're gonna end up, how it's gonna look. Then you go out and run them, so physically drive them on a scooter or in the car so you can see how it feels, how it would be as if you are a real taxi driver. 
Then once you finish that run, ideally you want to be calling them or calling the roads as you are driving it. Once you've stopped, either pull up to the side of the road and then try and recall what you've just done. Just think about the roads, link the streets and recall that. It might not stick, but then you go home and you do it again and again and again until it eventually sticks. And that is the blue book. So that's one run, you've got to do that for 320 runs across London. What these then do is that they form your basis of understanding the London knowledge. It's a bit like a phrase book, I guess. It's not gonna make you fluent in understanding London, but you're gonna have a pretty good idea of London once you've learned those runs. If you can bash out 10 runs in a week, you've got your blue book done in just 32 weeks, just over half a year. That's a pretty good pace to be going to. And if I'm honest, that's something I wish I did on the knowledge, which is having a clear schedule of how often you're gonna go out and bash out these runs. Collecting points of interest. Now, there's two schools of thought about when to collect points of interest. So, the first one is something called knowledge point, which years ago, when you go out and learn the 320 runs, as you're learning the runs, you would pick up some points of interest at the start of the run and you pick up some points of interest at the end of the run. And the reason being is that by the time you've completed all 320 runs, you might have amassed a few thousand points. I think if you collect four at the beginning, four at the end, you'd end up with about two and a half thousand points by the time you've ended up 320 runs. So it kind of makes sense that whilst you're in the area to save time, you might as well pick up some points. But the other and more new school method of doing it is via Wizan. Now, they say that you just go out and exclusively learn the runs, all 320 runs, and then you go out again just to go pick up points. The reason for this modality is simple. You are looking at London through one lens. So when you're out doing runs, you're just thinking about doing runs. And when you're out doing points, you're just thinking about points. You're gonna be going back to areas multiple times anyway. And it's not like one method is quicker and more efficient than the other. They both get you a badge. And if anything, if you're out doing just runs, then you can do more runs because you're not spending your time pointing and vice versa. But in terms of collecting points, how do you do that? Well, many schools actually publish sheets, basically daily sheets of what points get asked on examinations. Now, of course, the train stations and big points like hotels will get asked more frequently. And as you go down the list, you'll have stuff that gets asked less and less frequently, like really niche boutique places, that kind of thing. So it makes sense to start with all the big stuff. And generally, you'll pick up stations and stuff as you go out and about anyway. If a point comes out and you think, hmm, I've never heard of that before, you would write it down on a separate list and I would organize them by postcode. So what you could then do is over time, you might build up 20 points in W1 postcode, somewhere near here in Portman Square, and go and attack all 20 of those points whilst you're there to minimize the amount of time you're going back and forth. And additionally, when you are out pointing those 20 points you wanna go and look at, have a look at the other establishments around you. Is there a hotel? That's always prime to try and learn hotels. Obviously you can't learn all of them. If you tried learning all the ones up and down Sussex Gardens, I think you'd go absolutely mad. But the big ones, like the Churchill here, or the Nobu over on Upper Barclay Street, um, or even this club here, the Home House Club, here on the north side of Portman Square. And then once you've learned the point, you've not only got to learn the street that it is on, i.e. the Home House Club is on the north side of Portman Square here, but this is a one-way street. So you've got to be able to call your way out of Portman Square. What does that lead you into? Can you get a left out at the end of the street? Or have you got to keep going forward? Have you got to go around the square, etc.? And then usually you'll put them into some kind of a flashcards app, just so you can constantly revise those points and really get them inside of your noggin. Wizan also has a really good app for doing this as well. And it just means you don't duplicate a lot of your work. I spent a lot of time putting points in OneNotes app, going to go find the points, then putting them into another app or putting them into another flashcards app. And of course, this is all important time on the knowledge. So have a look, I'll put the link to all of the Wizan products down below and you can have a look for yourself if it's gonna save you time. So you've learned about 80 Blue Book runs. You've learned some points of interest. You can now go for what is called the stage one self-assessment. This is the first kind of examination you will do on your knowledge journey. It's now compulsory, but this used to be just like an optional extra. And it's kind of like a mock map test. So later on in your journey on the knowledge, you will do something called a map test. 
which I'll go into a bit more detail later on. But effectively, this is just like a practice version of that. Now, the pass mark on this is 60%, but you don't actually need to pass it. It is purely a mock examination. And this is largely for TFL's purposes to understand where you will be at on your knowledge journey. You have to take this within the first six months of applying and the actual examination has two parts. The first part is five questions based upon your first 80 blue book runs. It will basically be a multiple choice of three answers. One of them will be illegal, i.e. it will have a maneuver that's not possible. One of them will be a bit too wide and one of them will be the correct answer. The whole entire paper is out of 100 and those first five questions will bag you 10 points each for every correct answer. So 50% could be get there and remember it's 60% to pass. The second half of the paper is multiple choice for points of interest. They will say, where is the I don't know, Islington Ecology Center? And it'll give you a possibility of six streets that it could be based upon. So again, a multiple choice here, 25 questions in total. So every single correct answer equals to two points. Therefore, you only need to get five points of interest correct out of a potential of 25, so long as you got all five of your blue book runs correct, which you should do because if you've been working hard at your blue books, that should come naturally. Now, whilst this self-assessment is compulsory and it has to be done within the first six months of applying, it doesn't actually count for anything. He's winding me up, isn't he? So if for some reason you apply and the first six months, I don't know, something happens, well, it's still a good experience to actually go to that self-assessment anyway, because you'll learn where the TfL offices are, what the examination structure looks like, where to go, and all of that can save headache on future experiences when you go for your actual map test later on. So an ideal schedule, doing blue books and pointing. Ideally, you wanna get out on your bike as much as possible to go and complete those runs. My cadence was about three times a week. And when you're there, you might be doing about three runs at a time. It all depends what you can digest. So starting off, you might do two runs at a time because it is incredibly overwhelming. And then you can gradually ramp it up, especially towards the later end of the books, because you might start be using and borrowing streets that you've already done in previous runs. So there's a bit of duplication going on. So three days actually out on the bike, every single day of the week you need to be calling your blue books so the general practice is 80 runs a day and the whole reason for calling your blue books is that they are your fluency how the words come out of your mouth uh, how quickly you can recall the road names so it's really important to always be doing some kind of repetition in that domain it's like going for a daily jog or a daily run that just keeps your standard up there so that's a real important part and then of course you have points revision so every point of interest that you collect you ideally want to try and recall them the best method is through something called spaced repetition there's a few apps that do this through flashcards but basically when you know a point very well including how to leave it exit it and maybe uh, ideal turns etc you don't need to endlessly revise it if it's quite strong in the brain. So by using a flashcard app, this will actually space the intervals for you. Let's say Hilton Paddington, we're not too far from there. It's on Praed Street, there's a little forecourt to it. There's no restrictions leaving it or setting it, just north side of Praed Street. So you would have Praed Street on the back of the flashcard that says Hilton Paddington. Now, if you turn the flashcard over and you, you know, you've got it right, fine, you put it back in the deck, Maybe review it in an hour. In an hour, can you still remember it? Fine, review it the next day, one day. And then the one day interval might go to three days, a week, however long it is until it really ingrains in the mind. And then you don't need to recall it ever again. So active recall uh, or spaced, uh, spaced interval recall is the best way of kind of going over points. Daily basis is blue books, doing a lot of map work. So put in those blue books on the map. If you can't visualize them, if you can't visualize the map, just pen it up make sure it's all clear, uh, call them all over, and then move on to your points. That's kind of your schedule, as well as getting out and about on your bike, in the car, whatever it may be. So when you've gone out and learned your blue books, points of interest, you can start combining it 
all together into something called point to point, or it's sometimes abbreviated as P2P. And this is effectively the knowledge. This is where the magic starts to happen in your brain, where you get to combine roots and runs and really forge those deep connections in your mind. The whole idea behind point to point is that you can be asked one random location to any other random location, and you can mentally figure out the best route in between. Getting started on this part of the knowledge is the most difficult bit, hands down, because everything else has kind of been prescribed to you. Blue Book Runs, you just run it in the order it says, you call it over, done. It's relatively simple. But point to point, you actually have to kind of think about it yourself. You have to have your own interpretation. There's gonna be gaps within your knowledge that you then have to go back and fill. One of the ways of starting point to point is just adapting Blue Book Runs or jumping onto a Blue Book Run as much as possible. So for instance, I'm gonna draw up run number 106 which is Warwick Avenue Station to Haverstock Hill. So your mileage may vary on this slightly, like your route might be slightly different. That's absolutely fine. I've just penned this up. I don't know what the actual route is or what the most optimum is. That looks close enough to me, right? So I'm gonna leave by Clifton Gardens, left Lanark Road, right Sutherland Avenue, Hall Road, uh, Grove End Road, left up into Wellington Road or it becomes Finchley Road at that point. Right Queen's Grove, across the top, left Avenue Road, right Ellsworthy Road, and so forth. So that is a blue book run. But what if you then just move the start and end point ever so slightly? So rather than starting at Warwick Avenue Station, you can pick a point nearby to there. Edgware Road Station. Let's go to the Royal Free Hospital. So it's not a million miles different and you can maybe use some of the roads there. We're gonna use Edgware Road Station, but we're gonna use the entrance on Edgware Road itself. So you're looking straight down Edgware Road, you've got the uh, Marlborough flyover directly in front of you. You might say, well, you know what? I'm gonna just pick it up from Warwick Avenue. I know I can get from Warwick Avenue to Haverstock Hill, and then the Royal Free is not too far from Haverstock Hill. So effectively, you're getting yourself a right onto Harrow Road, keeping left, obviously, for the slip road, going round the Harrow Road roundabouts, round the Bishopsbridge Road roundabout, and then leaving by Warwick Avenue, and then going past the station that way, and picking it up right into Clifton Garden. And then when you call it, it's really important that you call it entirely from memory, and ideally have a call over partner, yeah, like your gym partner, effectively, they can then pen it up simultaneously as you're calling it. And then they can say afterwards, oh, you missed this road, you missed this road. If you don't have a call over partner, use a dictaphone and then use that to pen up afterwards. Now that you see the line, you'd go, oh, actually, I'd probably do a left there. Maybe go up Listen Grove, uh, do some John's Wood Road, Prince Albert Road, something like that, you know, to get it a little bit straighter, yeah? So you look at the new line that you've drawn up there, Try and memorize those roads, and it's important as well to make sure that those roads work, which is why a call over partner is good because two minds can sort of think about it and say, Oh, is it legal to do that? Well, you might need to write it down and say, Can I do this turn? and then you go back and call it again now that you've got the more optimum line in. Call it, look at the line again, and you just keep doing this process again and again and again. One day you'll call a line and it will be so wide and you think, bloody hell, how did I do that? But then you just go back to the board, find out the straighter line, call that, let that be your new kind of metric of what a straight line looks like and just keep on refining it. The key to the knowledge is trying to iron out your weak points. There's no point giving yourself a pat on the back and thinking, ah, I've done really well, I called that line perfectly. Because in an exam situation, not only is it going to be much more difficult, so you need to ensure that you can do these lines with much more confidence and fluency, but also the examiners are going to exploit your weaknesses. If they see a weak point, then I'm sure they will try and tear that open. And importantly, what you're doing on point to point is you're getting yourself to appearance ready. So far, you've just done the blue books, points, and now starting on this practice of point to point. Your next examination from this point is going to be the map test. And it's probably a bit of a stupid name, actually, because there's no maps involved within the map test. Point to point is exactly what will happen in the later examinations, which is your oral appearances. As soon as you pass that map test, you might be up in the next month, next two months for an appearance. So the sooner you can start doing this point to point, you know, start it as soon as possible. Go organic with your own points of interest. You still call your blue book every day as part of keeping those road names fresh, 
but this is what you're then going to be building up after you've done your blue book. So let's do another one I had in the taxi recently. Let's go from the Corinthia Hotel and we're gonna to go to the Mandarin Hotel. Super short run, but another way of doing this is that you can actually pin it to stations. Because stations are quite large immovable points, they can actually form really good references all across London. So I can look at the Corinthia Hotel and think, hmm, that's actually really close to Embankment Station or Charing Cross Station. And the Mandarin Hotel is really close to Knightsbridge Station. So really, it's not actually a case of going, oh, let's go from the Corinthia to the Mandarin. It's much like a run of going from Charing Cross or Embankment Station to Knightsbridge Station. And that makes the sort of thinking or process a much, much simpler process. We'll come out of uh, Whitehall Place, left Northumberland Avenue, comply King Charles I Island, and we're gonna leave that by the Mall, comply by Queen Victoria Memorial, leave by Constitution Hill, left to Quellen Place, I don't know if you touch Grosvenor Place, but then left into Knightsbridge, uh, and Bosch, set down on the right. Easy as that. So we streamlined it by attaching it to other points. And this is really how your point to point and how your appearance knowledge is going to grow. You're going to be borrowing other points of interest to have as many different data points in London inside of your brain to make this work. Okay, so we've done all 320 runs. You've probably got at least 2000 points of interest and you've started some point to point work. Now is the time to go for your stage two map test. You have to get at least 60% to be able to make your way onto appearances. Now, in theory, if you've done everything correctly, the map test should be an absolute doddle. I believe that the map test is largely for TFL's purposes to ensure that you are ready to move on to appearances. If you can't pass that map test, you shouldn't be going for appearances. Now, ideally, you want to get this map test done first time because if you have to resit it, I believe it's around £200 to do it each time. Now, I liken the stage two map test to what a theory test is to a driving practical examination. Whereby if you've been doing driving lessons, if you've been taking in the road and just been generally studying well, that theory test should be pretty simple. And it's the same with the stage two map test. If you've done the blue books properly, if you call them every single day, collect a good amount of points of interest, then that should be no problem at all. The pass mark, just like the self-assessment back at stage one, is 60%. Again, the format of how it works, the first part of the paper, blue book runs, they'll give any five from those 320 runs that you have gone out and learned. And then when it comes to the points of interest, they will give you a point of interest, let's say the RAC club. Well, it'll give you six potential roads that it could be based upon, and you just need to tick the correct answer. You might lose some points here because points of interest is a constant game on the knowledge. You're not going to know everything and it's quite unlikely you'll be able to get 100% on the map test. Straight after the map test, you're going to be getting going up for appearances. That is where the real knowledge starts. Appearances. This is the fun bit of the knowledge. This is where it all comes together. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the gold medal Olympic athlete performance that you need to get to, to be able to satisfy to an examiner that you have the knowledge of London so you can become a London taxi driver. Now, I really should add a shave. That's the other part, really. You gotta be really on point when it comes to your appearances. Not that like, you know, they'd send me home or give me a bad mark for not having a shave. It's just like, you don't wanna leave anything to chance. Have your hair cut, have a clean shave, you know, take your silly earrings out. That kind of thing. And of course, put on your nice suit. So how do the examinations work? Well, imagine the camera is the examiner and I am the candidate. Going one at a time, the examiner is gonna ask me just four questions. And that will be something as simple as saying, right, Mr. Tom, the taxi driver, where is the dog's trust? And I say, ooh, the dog's trust is Wackley Street in Islington, or Wakeley, whatever you wanna call it. And they say, okay, great. I would like to go from there to Battersea Cats and Dogs Home. You say, oh, okay, sir, ma'am. They must always refer to a sir or ma'am. That is just the tradition, that's the format. And you say, yeah, that's on Battersea Park Road, ma'am. And you have to call that entire route, not missing a street, ensuring that you are fluent within your calling. It's not a wide line. 
and of course that you got those points of interest because if you don't know the points of interest you will lose marks for that. The scoring system is a little bit ambiguous a bit difficult to understand but each one of those questions you can score a maximum of 10 points and of course with there being four questions that means for your entire appearance which will last 20 minutes you can get a maximum score of 40 points overall. In fact the passing criteria is exactly the same. The worst appearance score you can get is a zero, the best is 40, the pass mark is 24 points. Sounds really easy. You'll probably have at least a dozen oral appearances as part of your journey on the knowledge. And they're split up into three distinct stages. Stage three, four and five. So the very first of those stages, stage three, is what we call 56s because your testing intervals take place roughly every 56 days. Sometimes if there's less candidates on the knowledge, they can slim that down to six weeks rather than eight weeks. But that's kind of a formalized window. Every two months, you go for an appearance. And it's what can make the process a bit difficult because it's across those two months from examination to examination, you have to keep your standard so high. You can't just let off the gas and then think about it, you know, two months later, you have to keep practicing in between. Once you progress from 56s, you'll go on to stage four, where the testing intervals are every 28 days or one month, of course. And once you've progressed from that, you'll go on to stage five, which is potentially the final stage of formalized appearances. That's where the testing intervals go down to 21 days or every three weeks. The knowledge journey can really speed along at that point. But how do you progress through the stages? How does that work? To get from stage three along to stage four, you have to get four passes. It sounds really simple. So you have four examinations and you have to pass those. So in theory, because they're every two months, that takes you about eight months to achieve those four passes. The issue is, is that when you are on a given stage, you can only have so many failures. So as soon as you've got your fourth pass, so you've got three passes or C's is the kind of minimum pass mark. You've done three exams, you've passed three of those with a C and on your fourth C, you'll go on to the next stage, 28 or stage four. However, it's not just a case of accumulating four passes because you could say, oh, well, okay, what if I failed 20 times? As long as I pass four times, that's fine. No. You cannot accumulate more than three failures. So it's a little bit like a penalty shootout. So let's go through it this way. Let's just assume C, pass, D, not pass. You could go C, D, C, D, C, D. And that means you then have three passes, three fails. If you fail that tiebreaker, getting your fourth D, you have to go back to the beginning of that stage and begin again. You could get all four Ds, all four failures, straight off the bat, no passes at all. And again, you go back to the beginning stage, it's wiped clean. So ideally, you want to accumulate four passes before you get the four Ds. Whatever one comes first, whether it's four passes or it's four Ds, is then determines what the outcome of that stage will be. Once you've got your four passes, you then go on to the next stage. So if we're moving from stage three, you'll move to stage four, which is 28. You'll be going up every single month. That same scoring system will apply on all of the stages. The thing that's a bit better this time on 28 is that the intervals are much shorter. You're going up every single month. So it really pays, this is my top tip here, when you're on the knowledge, Stage three of appearances, your 56s, is really the crucial one that you want to get done as quick as possible because of the months in between. It's two months between each examination. So you don't want to have to screw up that whole entire section and go back and do it again. What they're looking out for and what the scoring criteria is, did you drop any points of interest? If they said, where's the business design center? And I say, oh, I don't know you lose a point. Is the line wide? When they pen it up and they look at it, is it the straightest it could be? Remember, the examiner is not looking for how you would drive it in real life, but more that you have got the perfectly straight line on the map. Can you put a piece of string from A to B and are you following that as close as possible? The examiner will also ensure that you're not missing out road names or getting them wrong, because if you do, that's another opportunity to lose points. And then finally, hesitation. If you take too long to answer, if you stutter, if you mumble, if you can't quite get it out, 
they're going to remove some points for you as well. Best advice, and again, I probably echo many knowledge students with this, is just go in there, be simple, calm, confident, fluent, and get your C. If you get a high score, that's great, but you just want to pass because if you get a D, well, depending which stage you're on, you've either wasted two months, one month, or three weeks of your knowledge journey. And we want to get our badge as soon as possible. Your daily schedule looks something like this. Calling runs, going out doing bike work, picking up new points of interest, new roads, revising your points of interest, calling the daily sheet, and if there's time for anything else, going over things like bankers, which are big questions that are sometimes repeated by examiners, not all the time though, maybe learning big runs across the map, like hospital runs, missing pieces, so being able to learn little tight streets that might be able to fill in some blank parts of your knowledge. Yeah, it gets really in depth quite quick and it is a juggling act to do all of these. My top tip would be, if you're struggling at any point in the knowledge, if you're struggling at any of the exams, for instance, is to look at the thing that you failed upon. If you mainly failed because of hesitation, that could be your fluency that is being compromised. So maybe you need to work more on your blue book because if your fluency is not there, that's not being communicated properly to the examiner. They might think that you're unconfident and as a result, they're probably putting you down for hesitation. If you're going slightly wide and you know your scorecard clearly says going too wide, then that might be an indication that you're not doing enough map work. You're not seeing how those lines translate onto the map. Maybe you're dropping too many points. Well, you might drop points at any stage in the knowledge. Even my final examination, I was dropping points because an examiner could pull some really obscure stuff. But you've got to really question deep and look at yourself and think, am I dropping big obvious points? If they ask you for a station and you don't know it, that's bread and butter stuff. Hotels, bread and butter stuff. You need to actively look for your weak points, areas of London that you don't know very well, because more than likely, that's where you're gonna become unstuck when you're in an exam situation. Okay, following stage five of your appearances, 21s, if you get four scores or four Cs, then you'll get the golden handshake from that examiner. Basically saying that you have satisfied the minimum required standard to be a London taxi driver. So from that handshake at that point there, your days of doing appearances based upon the six mile radius of Charing Cross are long gone. You have set that in stone, that's done. You've banked that, you are now effectively a cab driver. But there is one other formality you have to do before you can go get that elusive green badge. And that is something called stage six. It is the suburban runs. The suburb runs are basically doing long runs out of London to somewhere someone might want to go. Important stuff like, how do you get to city airport? How do you get to Heathrow airport? Those kind of things, because they sit outside of the knowledge perimeter, yet they are still quite important for when passengers want to go there. Thankfully, and best time ever now to do the knowledge, is that the suburb runs are just 25 runs. There used to be more than 100 of them. So you can get through those relatively quick. And the thing with the suburban runs is that you don't need to know obscure points of interest. You don't, the examiner's not gonna throw you any curve balls. It's gonna be a case of, here's the run. Can you call it from start to finish? You do four of those on a suburban appearance and bosh, you'll probably get another handshake and that's it. All of your examinations are done at that point. Your knowledge journey is finished. But there is one final stage, stage seven, which if you turn up on a Friday is badge day, stage seven, the easiest part of the knowledge journey. You just turn up to TFL and sit in a room with recent other graduates of the knowledge and they hand you a nice shiny badge, as well as a few other things and formalities about your new established career. From that point, you can go grab a taxi and go to work straight away that evening, as I did. It was the best feeling in the world. Just cloud nine and takes a very long time to come back down from there. To get to this final point, you would have done another criminal record check, and if you're of age, another medical. And that just ensures that you are good to go and be issued with one of these fun green badges. What a journey it has been. The question that's always on everyone's mind is, how long is this gonna take? What is the realistic timeline? The issue is, is that there's a few parts of the process that are a little bit out of your control, such as the appearances, those examinations. 
You know the intervals of how long each examination takes. However, a failure along that examination process could add another two months to the process. Multiple failures could add years to the process. So whilst you can get through the blue books in a relatively quick time, whilst you can go out and point at whatever pace you do, you may get held up by the examination system. So I'm gonna give you a couple of ideal scenarios how this could work. First one, let's go with like a relatively modest pace. And I'll explain why this may not be a good idea anyway, but we'll get to it. The fundamental bit to begin your knowledge journey, you have to learn the blue books. Let's say, you know, you take a year to complete those. It's about six and a half runs a week. So if you go out three times a week and you know, you do two and a bit runs, that's a really easy cadence to do. Should be simple enough. Don't do a me and I spent about a year and a half learning my runs, that's way too long. So you can get it done relatively quick, but one year is still pretty lazy. Let's just say you spend six months pointing and doing point to point because you wanna get yourself up to examination standard, of course. Then you go on to 56s, the process where it takes two months from examination to examination. Well, if you get through it in say six exams, so you do four passes, two fails, that might take a year. Then you move on to 28s, exam every single month. Again, let's just take six exams for that process, that's six months, and then you move on to 21s. Say you get through in six exams as well, i.e. four passes and two fails. That will take you four and a half months as well. Then of course you've got to do the suburbs. They used to give you an eight week time window to do the suburbs, but now the runs are much shorter. I'm sure it's probably able to be done within a month. You're talking about three and a half years in that scenario, which isn't bad, but it can be done better. And if anything, I would argue that the more you put into the process, the harder the cadence that you go at, the quicker you'll get it done, but you only need to go for that cadence for a much shorter period. When I went for my self-assessment, I remember one of the examiners saying that you kind of want to be like a ghost on the knowledge. Like the worst candidates, he said, were the ones where the examiners actually got to learn who those candidates were and the best candidates are the ones that got through lightning quick. The examiners never got to see them or build up a rapport of them because they were passing each time. You don't want to become a face at the examination center. So ideally, the deeper and more committed you go with it, the better your examination results will be, which then means you're more likely to get through the exams quicker and you're more likely to get your badge quicker. Yes, it's a sacrifice to put all of your life on hold, but would you rather kind of get your head down and get it done in two years, two and a half years, or would you rather just take it as a bit of a casual, don't know, yeah, I'll maybe go out and do a bit of pointing, and then it becomes a five year process and you've still got it looming over you. Five years, six years, seven years, some people take 10 years and beyond to do it. Now let's look at another example. If you get your head down, if you schedule it well, and you do really well on examinations, what can it look like? If you manage to go out and do 12 runs a week, which is about four runs a night, if you're going out three times a week, well, you've got free blue book in six months. Spend three months doing point to point, get yourself up to examination standards. And if you go through a C on all of your exams, so if you pass, it basically, if you don't get any failures, which is difficult, but it's not impossible, you'll get through 56s in eight months, you'll get through 28 in four months, and you'll get through 21s in three months. Add a bit of time on the end for suburbs. You're talking about two years from start to finish. Two years from knowing nothing about London to having a badge around your neck and you can go to work. I mean, that's quicker than a degree, that takes three years. And even when you don't a degree, you come out with loads of debt and you've still got to go get a job afterwards. Whereas on badge day, you get that badge and you go to work that evening. That's how cool it is. And you're right at the top. You're earning the same money as someone who's been in the profession for years. It's gonna be a serious investment of your time. The knowledge has always been difficult but right now is probably one of the best times to do it for a few reasons. First off, you can no longer get redlined. Redlined was a process where you got sent back to preceding stages. That can't happen now unless you are incredibly, incredibly bad. Like you have to be repeating the same process quite a few times before you get sent back. That added a lot of time to many people's knowledge journey. So just removing that removes a lot of pressure and headache. No more redlines. There's less suburb runs. So they would take about eight weeks to do. It was a hundred and something, I can't remember, it was about 150 runs or something, which were quite just an arbitrary box ticket exercise. They're now about 25 runs. So you can get through that much quicker. 
there's less road availability in the fact that there's more low traffic neighborhoods so in theory there's less you know second guessing and thinking oh could that road be tighter because you don't have as many wiggle throughs or cut throughs that there would have been when i was on the knowledge so it makes the process easier because it streamlines your thinking because you think, right, I can't go through that way. I have to stick it to the big roads. So I get loads of people message me and say, oh, is it a good time? Is it the best time to do knowledge? Right now, it's one of the best times to do it because of all of that. It's very fair and transparent. You know, if you go back to like the 70s, 80s, 90s, the system wasn't transparent. You didn't know where you was within the system. And, you know, this was before like equal opportunities and, um, you know, organizations kind of being like accountable it was its own kind of secret little thing so yes you might have been able to get out in quicker time back then but the actual process itself was a lot more brutal now it's a lot more of a formalized standardized system where you know where you are on your trajectory on your path to get in your badge but it just takes a little bit longer because of those official processes. So it's been a slightly different video, but it's one of the main aims of this channel. I wanna get more passengers educated on what we have to go through as London taxi drivers, but also importantly, get more men and women behind the steering wheel of taxis like this. If you want more resources from me, I actually made a book about my time on the knowledge and all of my best study practices. I included way more stuff in there about how to prepare yourself for examinations, uh, good practices, diets, everything like that that I used for my exam success. Or if you want me to go even deeper on this subject, do let me know in the comments down below. I've been toying with the idea of having a video that goes really deep and niche into what it takes to learn on the knowledge, like how you pick up points and things like that. So if that sounds like of interest, please let me know. I'll see you all again soon. Bye-bye.